live here from the Rising Coaches Classic uh, with Lipscomb head coach, Lenny Acuff. Coach, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me, Brian. I'm really uh, excited to be a part of this and thankful for what you guys are doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. What is your thoughts so far of uh, the Rising Coaches Classic? Yeah, you know, first off, thank you guys so much for the really nice gift when we got here. That was a really awesome surprise. And um, it's just, it's been, everything's been first class. Uh, you guys have put on a, a really, really first class event. Uh, being in Charleston at 75 degrees, mid-November, uh, gorgeous weather outside. And um, as you and I were discussing a little bit before we went on the air, you know, just the atmosphere they create in their building. Uh, this is something that I think could really turn into a special, special event. And uh, you guys getting involved is a, is a really good jump start, a good jumping on point. And um, we're thankful to be here. We just appreciate the hospitality and the way everything's been done since we got here uh, Wednesday night. Yeah, thank you, Coach. Yeah, we're excited to do the, the first one, you know, and from being coaches ourselves, I think we kind of understand how hard it is to do everything you have to do as a coach, whether it's coach or lead your team or schedule or whatever it may be. So we want to be as accommodating as possible. So, um, no, we appreciate you guys being here. Tell us a little bit about uh, your team before we talk about you, yourself, and your journey. Tell yeah, us. you know, um, it's good. So we're, we're, we're kind of a unique team now in college basketball, particularly after I sit there and watch Charleston play last night with 10 transfers. Um, you know, I, I got we have two transfers. One's a D2 kid with three years left that were red shirt, and then one's a – a kid from Valparaiso, Jake, Jacob Obnakovich, who actually led us in scoring the other night. He's a transfer from Valparaiso. We have a D2 kid from Drury. Valpo is Jacob. And uh, Jacob has got four years left. So we're we're going to dress 11 guys tonight. Six of them are freshmen. Uh, we have one senior on our team. Um, so we're really young. Uh, we're inexperienced. The, the thing that will be really different for us this year is we have three COVID freshmen, but they didn't play in front of anybody last year. So – just being in that building last night with that atmosphere and the energy, that's going to be something that's going to be different for us, something we're going to have to figure out early. But, um, you know, we we finished third in the A-Sun last year. Uh, two years ago, we lost in the championship of the A-Sun uh, tournament to Liberty. Um, and so, you know, we're a member of the A-Sun, Nashville, Tennessee. It's it's a basketball school. We don't play football. Uh, we have a longstanding tradition of winning in basketball. Basketball is important to our institution. And, and we're real fortunate. We have good kids and we have a, an administration that cares and wants us to win. And so uh, I feel real blessed to be there for sure. Yeah. Tell us about uh, this, the basketball place. A lot of people haven't maybe been to Nashville, uh, a lot of division one schools right there. People haven't necessarily been to your school in particular. Uh, me and you had this conversation off air with Avalyn Christian kind of being a, a brother, sister type school to you yeah. guys. And they've had success. Uh, you guys are a basketball place where they love basketball. So just talk about the the basketball environment and the job itself. Yeah, it, it's it's unique. Um, we only have 35 undergraduate students, so we're we're a smaller Division One school. But um, I've been here three years. The year before I got here, uh, they played in the finals of the NIT. Uh, they went on a run that they were able to beat. Uh, they won at Davidson, at UNC Greensboro, at North Carolina State, and then beat Wichita State in the semifinals of the NIT and then lost to a Texas in the championship game. Uh, they were in the NCAA tournament the year before, lost to North Carolina. Um, but but Lipscomb basketball, the tradition of it goes way, way back. Uh, Don Meyer, who was a legendary, legendary coach, um, and I think the greatest teacher of the game there ever was, his ability to teach fundamentals, X and O's, and, and to run camps and clinics. You know, It was the largest basketball camp in the United States for many, many years was at Lipscomb. And, uh, he started the heritage and the tradition there, and um, and obviously the move to Division One has, has raised the profile of of who we're playing and where we're playing. So um, it, it's really unique. Uh, you know, Nashville is a great town. Obviously, we're in a tremendously um, blessed area neighborhood. It's beautiful. Uh, we're tucked kind of back in a place called Green Hills, and two miles down the street is Belmont. Um, and that's the closest division ones, two closest division one schools in the country. Um, and then right around the corner from Belmont is Vanderbilt. And then about 10 minutes away is Tennessee state. So you know, you've got four division one schools all right there together. And, and there's a real uniqueness and, um, you know, Vanderbilt has a longstanding tradition, obviously, but, uh, Belmont has been fantastic and under Rick Bird and Casey Alexander. And 
so it's it's a really uh, basketball area. It's an area that people care and uh, and we think a real good level of play. Yeah, I would absolutely agree uh, with all those things you said, Coach. Talk about um, just talk about what it's like coaching right now during this time. It's a different era with uh, COVID, with uh, the transfer portal, with the extra year of eligibility. Uh, you guys actually had a summer. Everyone had a summer this summer. Last summer, yeah. you did not. Uh, I think people kind of just almost take that for granted. Just like, oh, they're playing games. Everything's easy. But college basketball is changing, and there's been some different challenges recently. How has that been? <laughs> yeah, it, it's real different. You know, this is my 32nd year as a head coach. Um, and third in Division One. I. I will coach NAI in Division Two basketball for 29 years. Um but it's a different world, even from what it was two years ago. Uh, it's the transfer portal. I think is going to affect things a lot more than the NIL. Um, you know, the NIL will affect some schools. It won't affect a great number of the Division One schools, um, the Power Fives, that type level. It, it, there will be some, obviously, some impact there. But the transfer portal. You know, and I sit there and watch Charleston play last night, and uh, you know that they they brought in all these new guys and. The roster was depleted, and um, and you can see a team. It, it, you know, for guys that have a Division II background, that would happen a lot. You would have a team that, um, like, had not been very good for a while, which obviously Charleston's been good. But teams that hadn't been very good for a while, well, a team you'll go from four and twenty-four one year to twenty-four and four the next year in Division II basketball because for so many years you could just flip your whole roster, um, and you don't have to. Kids didn't have to set out when they transferred in Division II. Right. either up, down, or whatever, they didn't have to set out. And so you would go play a team in March, and you play them again in November, and it's a completely different animal. I think you're going to see that in college basketball now. And I think um, it, it's either you, you you adjust to that or you end up – you're going to die. I mean, you just have to figure out how you're going to survive in that environment. But you also have to believe in who you are. Um, I think for us, we're going to try to do it with high school kids and – you know, there's always that concern. Well, if you get a really good high school player and he turns into an elite player for you, then he's going to leave. Well, at least he was an elite player for you for a while. And um, right. I think every, everyone has to know their situation. You have to get 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 a handle on just the, the demographic and the dynamic at your school and what fits and doesn't fit. And um, you're, you're going to see a lot high, this year in college basketball. I think you're going to see a really high level of play across the board. I agree. I think you're going to see some mid majors that nobody has heard of that are going to be really good because they've hit on a couple of kids. And then, and then what the, you know, the power fives, the highest level have been able to do is they just go and they fill needs right away. Um, right. And you can get down to a lower level. Um, and I think what you're going to see like last night, you know, that they play, they have the uh, division three, all American and division two, all American that walk right in and play for them immediately. Um, last year, we had the newcomer of the year, newcomer of the year in our league, and an all-conference player was a D2 transfer. And if a kid's a really good D2 player, he's going to be a good Division One player. No question. Um, and so I think you're going to see it affect every level. Um, I, I'm honestly not a big fan of it. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with transferring. I don't think there's – and there are out, outlying situations that I think it's okay for, um, for kids not to have to set out. But, you know, when you start that, you kind of open up Pandora's box and you can't put it back in. And and that's where we are now. Um, and so kids are going to leave and they're going to transfer and um, it's going to make it tough on people at times. But but you got to figure it out for sure. Yep. Yeah. You almost have no <clears throat> you almost have no choice but to adapt. Or like you said, you just get passed up. Right. Uh, let's talk about your journey, coach. Most head coaches don't necessarily come from lower levels to come up to the division one level. Talk about your uh, background, if you don't mind, kind of coming through the ranks. <clears throat> sure. Well, I think it's a, I think the thing I was visiting with you yesterday is that's why I respect what you guys are doing with rising coaches so much. And, and what, what a golly, when I was first getting into this, you know, 34 years ago, I would have ran to everything you guys were having because if you didn't play at a high level, uh, you know, if you don't have a pedigree that enables you to jump in at a pretty good level, it's a very, very, very difficult business to cultivate um, and and to navigate. Uh, I say a lot, it's a great profession. It's a bad business at times. And, and but groups like Rising Coaches are, are giving guys a way to connect and network. And so I, I would have been one of the guys that would have been sitting there. You know, I, I played NAIA basketball. 
uh, and, you know, didn't really didn't have anybody, didn't have a dad, brother, anybody that was in coaching, but I knew I wanted to coach. And so, um, you know, my first job was as a division two assistant at the University of Alabama at Huntsville. And, and, and the thing everybody needs to understand is there's a big difference in hitting a triple and being born on third. You know, most guys aren't born on third. You know, you have to have the ability to grind, uh, to be willing to move. Um, and, and I think the, I was really blessed to have opportunities that, that weren't great jobs, but they gave me amazing experience. You know, I was an assistant for two years at the Division II level. Then when I was 25, I got uh, had the opportunity to be a head coach at a small NAIA school in Jackson, Mississippi, Bellhaven College, and I'll be forever grateful for the opportunity I had to do that. And I was there for three years, and, and golly, the experience and the things that I learned in those three years, I, it, it, you just can't put a price tag on it. Uh, I made no money. Um, you know, it's, you know, you drive the vans, you watch the uniforms. I was the janitor. I helped set up the concession stand, but it was fantastic for me. But I was so thankful to have that opportunity. Um, you know, I moved to Jackson, Mississippi. I was single. I knew no one had never been to Jackson. I mean, those things are tough, but if that's what you think you want to do, if you want to get into this, you got to be willing to do it unless you really are blessed with a pedigree or playing at a level that gets you to that point. Uh, we, we did okay there, and I was able to get a, a job at Barry College in Rome, Georgia, which was NAI at the time. They're Division Three now and had a great experience there. Uh, we had a good run, and I was there for four years. And then, uh, then I was really fortunate. I got the head coaching job at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And um, it was a Division II school. Um, it, it, it had not had a lot of success, um, actually. When, when we went there, they'd had one win in season in 16 years. Um, it just had transitioned from NAI to D2, which is a tough, tough transition from anybody. I'm not being critical of anybody that was there. It's just, it was it was in a tough situation. And But we went there and were there for 22 years and, and really had an amazing, amazing run because of uh, the great community, uh, really fortunate, I had great help as assistant coaches, and most importantly, we're able to recruit good players. Um, and so I was there for 22 years, and then three years ago, um, I was offered the opportunity to come to Lipscomb, and and I've really enjoyed it. So I, I, I think I hopefully that gives guys hope uh, that hey, if I think one day I want to coach at the Division One level, um, that that there's an avenue to get there. Sometimes it's not easy, but you know the thing that I would really want to encourage guys with that that are involved in your organization is. Whatever job you have, it, it's got to be the most important job in the country. When I was at Bellhaven 34 years ago, 32 years ago, I mean, that, to me, that was like coaching at Duke. I mean, they're, they're, I, I couldn't care less what was going on anywhere else. And, and the most important thing was those kids. It was their opportunity. You know, it, 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 this is those kids' one chance to have that year. And, and I really wanted to make it important for them. I wanted it to be fun for them. And I wanted to think it was somewhere that it mattered. And, and I thought we did that. And, and so, I, and I honestly, I never took any job with the intent of leaving. I, I think you go there and, and you work like you're going to be there the rest of your career. You have to understand you could be gone the next day for good reasons or bad reasons. But, um, but I just the on the job training, you know, um, I guess I, I'm 32 years. I probably coach close to 900 games now. And, um, and it's amazing how much every single day you realize you don't know. And I think I'm trying real hard to keep learning and growing. And but but I do think you have to be willing to move. You have to be willing to take a job that a lot of people are going to tell you, well, you can't win there. or That's a bad job. Well, that's easy when you're sitting on a division one bench and you're making a six figure salary and you played at a high level. You know, ever everybody's got to go write their own story. Everybody has to make their own path. And but I think if you keep the main thing, the main thing is the opportunity you have to impact kids. Um, you realize, man, those kids sitting in any locker room in this country, they're starving for a great opportunity. And, um, and, and, you know, if you don't think a coach is important, I, I've seen this with my own children, what, wait till your own children get coaches. And, right. and then you realize, wow, man, it, that it, it's, it's an honor. It's a privilege and it's responsibility when you stand up in front of kids that you're called to lead. Yep. Amen. Yeah, you mentioned the main thing being the main thing, and you mentioned your kids. Talk about, Coach, if you don't mind, um, you know, the, the challenge of this business. Talk about how you've been able to incorporate family and incorporate your faith 
in a business that doesn't always celebrate those two things, if we're being honest. So uh, not that they don't want them, but it's not something that you don't necessarily get rewarded or uh, celebrated for those things. If you don't mind yeah. talking to me about that. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, you, you have to know who you are and you have to know what you believe in. And, you know, as, as a Christian, uh, as a man of faith that falls short every single day, um, I think you have to understand that, you know, I, there's so many more important things in life than basketball. And I, I don't care. You can be the greatest success anywhere else. But if you're a failure at home, um, then I don't know really how much you succeeded. Uh, you may be celebrated, like you say, in social media by all the pundits that talk about college basketball or coaching. But but I, I think, you know, there's no dress rehearsal. There's no do over in parenting. And I shared with you yesterday, you know, we had some opportunities when I was at Huntsville to leave, but my wife and I made the decision once our children got in the seventh grade that, that we were going to stay. And that that's not for everybody. It doesn't make me a saint. It's just, that's what I believed. And um, I, I think that the guys have worked with me that and are on our staff now, they see that I, I think there's a really, everybody thinks you have to spend all these hours at the office and it's really important that you work hard, but you have to work smart too. I, I think, Working hard is a jumping on point. What, what you want to do is you want to make sure you get stuff done. Um, that's what I tell our guys all the time. I try not to micromanage those guys. I, I, I tell them every time their kids has something, they need to be there. Um, don't I mean, if you need to leave practice early, that's fine. I mean, there, there's we can figure this out, but you're not going to have a chance to see your kid play sports, to, to be involved in school things, to be involved in church uh, functions, what, whatever it is, you've got to be a part of their life. And there's going to come a time they're not going to be there. And, and you don't want to say, well, my dad won all these basketball games or he coached at the highest level, but I, I never really got to see my dad. And I, and that's just what I believe. It doesn't make it right. It's just, and, and I think it's okay to have different opinions on that, but I, I really tried hard not to compromise that. And, uh, and I'm real fortunate now, you know, my son played college baseball and he thinks he wants to coach college basketball and he's on our staff as a GA. So I'm, you know, it's kind of come full circle. Um, but, but I think making sure you keep your family uh, at the forefront because it, it, it's, I've seen a lot of things go South when you get away from that. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. It's easier said than done, but I think you, <clears throat> you hit on it. Just having that conviction early and sticking to it. You know, I think the, the challenging part about this business is when you do have the hot seat or when you do have a situation where you feel like um, I need to move for this opportunity, but my family has to stay back. And how do you manage that? So definitely great advice. Appreciate that. Uh, Coach, we'll, we'll let you go after one last question. If you want to share a, a fun story, funny story, or just a cool story of something that you experienced in your time and all these years coaching. Oh, wow. Um, that, that's a great question. I, you know, um, you know, you get to do a lot of neat things and, you know, when you've done it for a long time, you know, really coaching is about making memories. Yeah. That, that's really what it's about. It's yeah. about making memories. And and that's what I tell our guys every year. I said, I want them to have a great experience and I want them to have great memories. If we can do that, then we, we're doing our job. Um, you know, I think I, I share this a lot when I speak is there's two types of coaches. It's those that are humble and those that are about to be it's coming. It's I mean, coming. like tonight could be really humbling for us. We play a great team in a big time environment and we don't play well. We're going to get we're going to get spacked. And uh, but I, I guess a quick the first story I would think of, which puts things in perspective is, I don't know, it was seven or eight years ago. I'm really terrible with years, but we had a really good team at Alabama Huntsville. And we were fortunate enough to be the first Division two team to get into the uh, preseason in IT okay. and the NCAA ran the preseason in IT at the time. So long, long story short, we go to Kansas State. And um, and I remember we got the contract. You got X amount of dollars for being in the tournament. But if you want a game, it was like the NCAA tournament, you got another share. And I think the share was $50,000. We go to uh, Kansas State and we play North Texas the first night. And they were in some top 25s. They had a lot of what a lot of people thought was going to be a lottery pick. And uh, we oh, played. Job, buddy, right? I'm sorry. Tony Mitchell, I believe, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yep. we go to play them, and uh, they were preseason number one in the Sun Belt or whatever league they were in at the time. And and uh, we went in there, and, and we beat them. Uh, we won the game, and I remember they missed a shot. Um, had a good look at three that would have tied it, and, and they missed it. 
And honest to goodness, the first thing I thought was, and this is so when you you know you've coached at Division One, Division Two, or small college basketball, they missed the shot. The first thing I thought was, we just made fifty grand, and it wasn't that we won a game. It wasn't, it's like there's fifty grand right there. But and obviously that was that was like at ten o'clock on a Monday night, and it was incredible, and it was such a great thing for our kids. We were walking off the court, and the 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 lady running the event came up, and she said, "Hey, now, now remember tomorrow night, you're the last game." of the 24 hour marathon and you'll be on ESPN. So we're playing Kansas state the next night. And so, you know, we, we have this unbelievable, one of the greatest wins ever for our program, our school. Yeah. And then 24 hours later, we're playing Kansas state on ESPN. And, and I'm not kidding you. I, I mean, I, I didn't know if we were going to get to 10. I mean, we could not <laughs> get a shot out. You know? And in those games, you, you only play five or six guys because you, you can't just go to your bench as much in those kind of games. Right. And I remember sitting there and I thought, man, we didn't even get to enjoy this for 24 hours. You know, you, it, having one of those weeks where everybody's so excited for you, you get a thousand texts and all that. And then 24 hours, we just, we got beat like 50. I mean, it was, it was, it was tough, but I learned and many, many other times I've learned is that it'll humble you. And if you think you got all the answers, you, I, I'd like to meet you because I sure don't. And uh, it's a player's game. It's always going to be a player's game. But, you know, that's why I think having things in perspective and understanding there's a lot more important things in life. But, you know, last thing I would say, too, is, is just just get with the people when you network. You've got to make sure you're with the right people. Don't always be worrying about somebody that can do the most for you. Don't, you know, it, it, that those things take care of their self. You want genuine relationships. And, um, I, I've got guys that I started in the business with that that are friends of mine still today. And it, I've seen them go through highs, lows. They've seen me go through highs, lows. But the really, truly authentic relationships are the ones that matter. It's not who can I know at the highest level. Guys, I mean, treat everybody the way you want to be treated. I know I was raised to understand that, you know, you're no better than no one else and no one else is better than you. And 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 just go, approach it with that mindset. But um, thank you so much for having me. You guys have done an amazing job of this uh, event here in Charleston. I, I hope you guys will stay involved in that. And if for any young coaches that ever want to reach out, anything I can ever do, I'd be honored to to help anyone I could. Yeah, absolutely, Coach. We appreciate you and uh, salute to your career and doing it the way you've done it and uh, the success that you've had and kind of just winning no matter where you are and not just winning on the court but off the court. So we salute you. We're excited during this event and we look forward to staying connected along the way. Oh, absolutely. Thank you guys. Have a blessed day. Okay. Same to you coach. All right.